From January to March of 2002, players were strapped into a chair while tennis legend John McEnroe asked them questions and increasing difficulty. All the while, they would be bombarded with trials designed to scare them and raise their heart rates. Live alligators, a nest of bees, boa constrictors, jets of fire, you name it. If their heart rate rose above a certain level, their winnings would be penalized for every second that they were in violation. That was the basis for the whole show. It was rushed into production early that year, often with the filming of episodes being done on into the middle of the night, in order to compete with Fox's upcoming game show, The Chamber, which found contestants picking one of two chambers labeled hot or cold. Hot started at 110 degrees Fahrenheit and would gradually climb to 150 degrees, while cold would begin at 30 degrees and fall to negative 20. Players would be asked questions, and with each correct answer, their prize pool would go higher, but their chosen chamber would become more extreme. If they could weather the storm, their money would increase. Additional challenges would be thrown their way as the game progressed. While in the cold chamber, water would be sprayed on competitors and ice can be seen visibly clinging to their skin. Contestant Scott Brown was the only one to ever make it through all seven levels of the cold chamber while answering 20 questions correctly winning a prize of $20,000, the highest amount given so far in the show's run. After taping, Brown would be hospitalized with hypothermia. The show would be canceled after just three episodes. In the year 72, the Roman Emperor Vespasian ordered the construction of the Colosseum and was completed just eight years later by his son, Titus. It was in this place where, over the next four centuries, it is estimated that roughly 400,000 people lost their lives in mutual combat, animal fights, chariot races, and naval battles, all done in front of thousands of cheering Romans. 2,000 of those deaths happened in just the first 100 days alone during its three-month marathon commencement of games. Vespasian had inherited a fractured Rome. After the suicide of Nero in June of 68, he had been succeeded by Galba, who ruled until his assassination in January the next year, who was succeeded by Otho, who took his own life just three months later, in which Vitellius then took the throne, but in December of that year, abdicated and was executed by Vespasian's men, who found himself the fifth emperor of a divided nation in a span of just over a year. The term bread and circuses comes from this era. It is a pretty self-explanatory idea that comes from the time of the grain dole in Rome, where grains and bread were subsidized to all citizens in a time of political turmoil, where the structure of the empire was changing from its days as a republic. Penned by the poet, Juvenal, as a criticism of a cultural problem he saw, of a people who no longer connected in spirit with their history, their duty to being involved in the political process, abandoning their rights in exchange for an easier life, filled with entertainment, distractions, and a full belly. An erosion of civic duty in favor of sadistic pleasures watching the downfall of those who happened to be in less fortunate situations than they were. The phrase was coined when he wrote, Already long ago, from when we sold our vote to no man, the people have abdicated our duties. For the people who once upon a time handed out military command, high civil office, legions, everything, now retrains itself and anxiously hopes for just two things, bread and circuses. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, a dance marathon craze swept the country to entertain the masses, many of which had recently found themselves freshly out of work, bitter, with nothing of substance to occupy their time with. And so, day after day, night after night, audiences would return to see if their favorite couples were still on the dance floor. The rules were simple. Couples had to be dancing on their feet 45 minutes out of every hour, 24 hours a day. The last couple left dancing took home the prize, which was usually around $1,000. During their 15-minute rests, the dancers would be so tired that they would, from exhaustion, immediately fall into a deep sleep and would often rely on each other in alliances to use smelling salts to make sure they were all awake in time to rejoin the dance. The beds were frequently displayed in an area where the audiences could see, and the humor of watching these tired people try to wake up after just 15 minutes of sleep was considered a part of the appeal. In some instances, the crowd would start cheering as loud as they could during the 15-minute break to ensure that the couples could not get any sleep. As the decade went on, these dances became more and more of a sadistic spectacle for the crowds. 
Throughout the day, foot races around the dance became a common added element that could be demanded at any time. Sometimes dog collars were placed on the men to be paraded for the audience. Contest judges would often walk the dance floor with sticks or rulers and would whip the legs of any dancer who did not have sufficient pep to their movements. All acts of human behavior would have to be done while dancing, shaving, bathing, using the bathroom, even writing letters and occasionally sex, would happen in full public view to a paying audience who were allowed to watch for 24 hours a day. For a door fee of just 25 cents, you could stay as long as you would like in these large tents or gymnasiums to watch agonized couples boogie for a chance at the prize that was slowly being paid for one quarter at a time. A great deal of contestants were not even interested in winning the prize money or knew that they were too old or too out of shape to have an actual real shot at winning, but entered the contest because it guaranteed them a shelter to sleep and several hot meals throughout the day, so long as they could keep up the dance. These would go on at least weeks at a time. It was not unusual for them to last for months. One marathon in Boston began in December of 1931 and did not end until June the following year. Callum de Villiers would take home the prize money, which he danced seven consecutive months for. He would win just $1,000, which would be less than $20,000 today. When he died, his tombstone read, World Champion Marathon Dancer, 3,780 continuous hours. Many people died from fatigue on the dance floors. A great deal more would take their own lives after being eliminated. At a certain point in these competitions, psychosis was almost a guarantee. Author Horace McCoy worked in this time as a bouncer at these thousand hour dance marathons and would use this experience to write one of the most seminal novels of the Great Depression. They shoot horses, don't they? which was adapted into a film of the same name starring Jane Fonda in 1969, which I believe was probably the first game show gone wrong type of film, or at least should be seen as an early prototype of that kind of idea. This is about as close to a work of horror a period drama can get without fully crossing over into genre territories and is extremely uncomfortable to sit through. It is a fairly straightforward presentation of these types of proceedings, the corruption behind the people leading it, the cruelty, the unrelenting nature, even death on the dance floor. The film just goes on and on as we voyeuristically watch as these people go about their lives for weeks on end, as they sleep, shower, exist in this prison of economic circumstance. Our couple who we follow, Gloria and Robert, only quit after learning near the end of the competition that the cost of food and board are going to be deducted from the prize money if they should win and that the last standing couple will take home almost nothing when it is all said and done. Outside the dance hall, they talk about how they feel nothing anymore, about how life is meaningless to them, about how this experience has changed them in irreparable ways that can never be undone. Gloria hands Robert the pistol that she keeps in her bag and asks him to do what she cannot. The dance continues, at that point reaching 1,491 hours and counting. But today, I primarily want to look at one film that took the central idea of they shoot horses, don't they, and updated it to codify what this subgenre would look like through the lens of new national broadcast technologies. In my eyes, it is one of the best films to ever tackle this kind of subject, 1975's Rollerball, which to me is one of the most unsung genre films of this period that is still relevant to this day. The highly successful Rollerdrome from earlier this year is essentially a video game adaptation of the film. And if it had not existed, then I would argue that other countless works like Twisted Metal, Hunger Games, Battle Royale, and Squid Game would have similarly never been created, or at the very least, would have been quite different. And while other smaller films did exist before this one, such as the German made-for-television game show thriller, The Game of Millions, Rollerball really got the ball rolling here. I'm sorry. Set in the far future of 2018, in a time that has ceased to have functioning governments, it depicts a proto-Gibson-esque world where countries do not matter. There are still cities, there are still national anthems, and places that once had the names of countries like America or Japan. But these things are now meaningless, ideas of an old world. Governments, while technically existing, hold no tangible power. And there are now only six mega corporations that work together to control every aspect of everyday life. Their domains are energy, food, transportation, communications, 
housing, and luxury items. And by working together, they have created a public mindset that this was done for the good, that together they have all built a better world, that there is no hunger anymore like there used to be, no homelessness, no poverty, no sickness, no wars, and all that it cost was personal freedoms and the concept of the individual. All that is ever expected is to follow the company's directives without question, because the decisions are always supposedly made for the benefit of everyone. And if these orders are followed, then well-behaved citizens receive credits on their privilege card, which can be exchanged through the luxury corporation for many types of goods. The general population is medicated to the point of unquestioning obedience, but still, something is needed within their lives, something that is lacking, and that void is filled with rollerball. A ruthless game of gasoline, violence, adrenaline, speed, sweat, blood, often death. Spiked gloves punch warriors to the ground, motorbikes propel skaters faster and faster, all in the attempt of getting a metal ball into the goal. A nightmare reflection of the future of the world of televised sports. From my perspective, this isn't some sort of poorly made sci-fi slop like the name may sound. It is a genuine production. Is it silly at times? Sure. But there's a real genuine earnestness to it that is hard to find in movies like this. The 2002 remake is probably more in line with what you would mentally expect from a movie like this. The director Norman Jewison had previously made major Hollywood films, such as In the Heat of the Night, The Thomas Crown Affair, Fiddler on the Roof, and Jesus Christ Superstar. There was some genuine talent behind this, and while it may drag in some of its slower character moments, in the sports sections, it comes alive on the screen. Its documentary handheld style, filmed right in the action with quick rapid cuts, still holds up, and is better than a lot of action that you'll find today. The over-prolonged emphasis on the reactions in the crowd, their face telling us the story of the game that we are never fully told the rules of. They carry these scenes as the connecting tissue that binds it together. In the midst of the action, the quick shots back to the most slug-looking corporate investors they could cast. It's great stuff. The extras in the film for the matches were paid more than what was typical at the time to cut their hair to gel with the more forward-thinking fashion that they were given to enhance the film's futuristic and supposedly non-70s feel. And while I appreciate the attempt, the sheer number of mustaches, flowing clothes, open chest shirts, and disco funk soundtrack can't quite cleave it from that decade. There's a strong queer undertone to Rollerball, sequences of the men together in the shower, the muscle close-ups while they work out together in the gym. Jonathan's continued uninterest in the new wives that the corporation offers to him is a reoccurring theme throughout the film. In one of the very first close-ups of Jonathan, he's sitting nude in a chair while his chest is being massaged by another man, while he's being spoken to by his corporate handler. That said handler later has an extended touch of Jonathan's knee while having a casual conversation with him. The corporation years previously made an executive decision to take Jonathan's first wife from him. Without reason, they forced them to divorce, only saying that this was in the best interest of everyone involved. Jonathan is made to be alone, a perfect physical specimen of the male body, for the company to own and to use, his handler often looking at him like he is a toy and only that with longing eyes. This is all probably done to reconnect to that historical, masculine, muscle worship, slave gladiatorial idea of these kinds of public spectacle fights. It is a reoccurring theme in these types of works, taking that idea from ancient times and then recontextualizing it into the modern world of corporate empires. The games themselves, as well as Jonathan, become a bit allegorical for the fight for individual autonomy in authoritarian restrictive governmental circumstances. The company board openly says in their meeting that the purpose of the game is to symbolically show that no single person is more important than the group, that only by working as a team can they succeed in winning, that the individual player cannot do this on his own. The central conflict of the film is not on if the team will win or not, because ultimately that is always meaningless. The conflict stems from the company telling Jonathan that it is his time to retire and that he is expected to make a public statement which he refuses to do because he feels like he still has more that he can do for the sport. The theme of the conflict at the center of the film is summed when his handler says to him, 
no player is greater than the game itself. The Running Man, which would come a tad over a decade later, and being based on a novel by Stephen King, is essentially an 80s remake of what Rollerball did with the genre, but would push it to new places with its Reagan-era spin, to both its messaging as well as the aesthetic to its story of death row convicts being forced to fight for their lives on national television. Everything is taken to an extreme here, to match the feel of the decade. It is a supreme exaggeration of what was in itself an exaggeration of the core idea of gladiatorial combat, and public exhibitions like the ones seen in They Shoot Horses, don't they? Of the spectator nature of live events, and the growing industries of broadcast entertainment. But at the end of The Running Man, Ben Richards exposes the government's lie to the world. He is successful in destroying the concept of the Running Man show. He starts a revolution and movement that is implied to continue and to be successful after the film has concluded. I don't know if that is the messaging that was supposed to be intended with this type of thing. Soon after that, we saw the release of the small drive-in knockoff film Death Row Game Show, which is essentially just a spin on the same idea, where those who are on Death Row can compete in televised games to try and save their skins. And in the years since then, there have certainly been more examples of similar types of films. But to me, by and large, they all sort of miss the point. Jonathan in Rollerball defies the company when they try to forcefully retire him. And as a response, they change the rules and encourage the opposing team at the championship game to kill their competition in the match. It soon turns into an all-out gladiatorial battle, where in the end only Jonathan makes it out alive with the final scene showcasing him taking a victory lap around the stadium, as fans cheer his name over and over again. But what victory is there to celebrate here, really? Jonathan skates around the corpses of his teammates and best friends, while the audience cheers. Has he really won anything? The point of Rollerball, that all other films like this would ultimately miss, is that there's no winning in a situation like that. You won't overthrow the authoritarian government you won't beat the corporation at their own game. The worst you can do is spit in their face before they kill you and bury your memory forever. This isn't a cheerful ending, it's a Tiananmen Square. At the time, the film was reviewed poorly for this very reason, for its pessimism, with many contemporaries saying that it was too grim, too self-serious, overbearing. Jonathan Rosenbaum even described the film as a classic demonstration of how several million dollars can be unenjoyably wasted. The director, Norman Jewison, said the following during an on-set interview during the production of the film on why he felt compelled to make this. I think Rollerball is a warning that possibly in 10 or 15 years, 20 years, a game like this indeed will exist, and we will indeed be at the hands of, let's say, a corporate society. I'm making this film because it is about an aspect of society that exists today in America and in many other countries in which it seems to me that the audience is demanding more and more excitement, more blood, more speed, more danger. I also know that there are certain sports that come to be out of gladiatorial combat. This is a gladiatorial sport. I think that's what this is all about, and what people want from each other and demand from each other. You know, horror is often unfairly accused of being reactionary. And while I do see this film in a way as being a bit Randian and anti-communistic, with its undertones of the importance of the special chosen macho individual's rage and fighting for control over his art. I do also think that it's a valuable work of speculative science fiction, because in a way it kind of came true. Jewison was proven right not even a full year after he made the film. These action sections were so difficult and dangerous that it would lead the film to become the first Hollywood production to list its stunt performers by name in the credits, which I know is not saying a whole lot as it should be standard practice, but still. For a lot of these needed shots, there wasn't really a way to do it through trickery or suggestive camera angles. And so most of the time, these guys actually just had to do this stuff flipping over each other on skates and bikes on this hardwood floor. Very little of what was going on in this was actual movie magic. In order to have a genuine sense of realism, the game did have actual rules and regulations designed on how it should be played, and was so thought out that in their downtime, the stunt performers would hold real matches against each other in the arena set for practice. And while the film's overall message was one of anti-violence, and was intended to be a commentary, 
on American entertainment's constant bloodlust, as well as being anti-commercialism. Jewison was horrified when he heard that based on the positive reaction to these sections, and the overall success of the film, as well as since there were actual rules created for how the game should be played, there were talks with network executives of starting national rollerball teams to play against each other for television broadcast. What he was trying to warn against was almost put into motion by the very thing that he created. I would not be surprised if, in the late 80s, there had been talks about if they could or could not get away with making actual criminals participate in real-life Running Man competitions before just deciding to make American Gladiators instead, a show that would slowly mutate over the next decade until it turned into its own pro-wrestling, deathmatch-inspired competition that starred a not-yet-famous Terry Crews going by the name T-Money. Which brings to mind that later this year we're getting a real-life version of Squid Game produced by Netflix where 456 real-life contestants will be competing for $4.56 million in a production that has been described by its contestants as cruel, inhumane, and rigged. Reportedly for this, they filmed a nine-hour game of red light, green light in a freezing airport hangar, sometimes being stuck holding in the red light position for over half an hour, while time was paused so that medics could assist people who could not handle the extreme cold. One contestant anonymously told Rolling Stone, It was just the cruelest, meanest thing I've ever been through. We were a human horse race, and they were treating us like horses out in the cold, racing and the race was fixed. Another added, All the torment and trauma we experienced wasn't due to the game, or the rigor of the game. It was the incompetencies of scale. They bit off more than they could chew. The contestants claim, that it was clear that the results of the game had been predetermined before they filmed, and that many of the contestants were social media influencers, YouTubers and TikTokers, who supposedly were given special treatment compared to the other contestants, and had the rules bent in their favor. The final insult was that more contestants reportedly crossed the finish line with time to spare in the red light, green light game than was expected and producers on the show are said to have eliminated 38 people who had successfully completed the challenge, covering them in fake blood and forcing them to go lay out in the hangar for B-roll footage. One of the contestants would say, It really wasn't a game show. It was a TV show. And we were basically extras in a TV show. Netflix would put out a statement that read, Any suggestion that the competition is rigged or claims of serious harm to players are simply untrue. We've taken all the appropriate safety precautions, including aftercare for contestants. And an independent adjudicator is overseeing each game to ensure it's fair for everyone. But if the rigged accusations are indeed true, then that certainly opens them up to severe litigation, as ever since the quiz show scandal of the 1950s, it is American federal law that in situations like this evidence must be provided. The producers have not interfered in the show to have a predetermined narrative-based outcome for the events of their competition. That rules were both enacted and followed to the best of their ability to be as fair as possible. And that failure to be transparent in these issues can result in massive fines as well as possible prison sentences for the producers involved. 1975 also saw the release of Death Race 2000, which would tackle many of the same issues. Although, as a whole, it is considered more of a cult classic than Rollerball and has more modern recognition. I don't think it's nearly as good. In fact, I kind of think it's a garbage movie and is way more on the nose with what it's attempting, but does still have its fun. Sylvester Stallone's knife car is an iconic vehicle in film history and overall does have its place as one of the many Game of Death movies that sparked a whole subgenre. This also has ties into the similar Death Sport in 78 that would take place much farther in the future in a Mad Max-style world, yet still would be focused around a public spectacle death motorcycle game. One movie of note to me in relation to all of this is 1976 Roller Babies, the adult film parody of Rollerball. Now, there's almost no footage from this movie that I can show you here, so apologies if I reuse some shots while talking about it. Some would argue that this is not actually a real movie, and those people are probably right. But this comes from an era where they really tried to give you a little something extra, a story that you could keep watching after you normally would be finished with this type of media. It is the kind of film that Burt Reynolds and Boogie Nights would have been proud to have made, a movie that almost says something. 
It is a no-budget movie that was made in under a week. I mean, one of the main props in the film is a pillbox, with its label made out of some tape and a marker. But at the same time, it is still also the only pornographic film to ever be screened at the World Science Fiction Convention, as well as the only one to ever be considered for a Hugo Award. In being a parody of Rollerball, it similarly takes place in a future where, instead of violence, sex has been outlawed except for acts being performed on live television by licensed workers. Visual stimulus becomes the only legal outlet for these human needs and emotions. We follow Sherman Frobish, a cartoonishly large cigar-smoking Stephen King lookalike producer on the Fuckin' Suck Show, who befriends the mad scientist Dr. Roxoff, who together work to rekindle a sexual revolution in the world. Their solution, to start a new adult entertainment channel, where players compete nude on roller skates against each other in teams. I would go more into the specifics, but I don't think I'm allowed to do that here. What I find fascinating about this is they really aren't parroting Rollerball and what it was overall about. In fact, they almost have the inverse messaging of being overall positive about the future of media. In this, you can see a desire by these filmmakers to depict a future where the art that they make is not only seen as normal and acceptable entertainment, but is also mainstream, destigmatized, aired on primetime television. They envision a world where adult entertainment not only is accepted, but also embraced. There's this throwaway line in this, where someone mentions that they went to college for pornographic studies, which honestly is kinda great world building that tells you a lot about this place. We also have female androids that are being used in the television program and the history of those in film, and their connection and implication and optics to the rights of women throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s could have a video on its own. And look, this movie's goofy as hell. You know exactly what this is. This was the same year as Carrie, so you even get a scene where a woman uses her telekinetic powers to seduce a man from across a room. And you know, maybe this movie has absolutely nothing that it is actually trying to say. Maybe it is just a sleazy skin flick that I'm reading way too much into, but I think a conversation can be had about the nature of sex meeting violence as public entertainment spectacle in the liberated 1970s by comparing these two films. Maybe these two as a whole combined equal more than they do apart on their own. One world that embraces public violence and a mirror image of a prudish one that rejects all notions of sex and a dream that things could be better. In a way, they are one and the same, and reflect our own cultural attitudes that we still have to this day. The scene you have just witnessed contains redeeming social significance. What does the existence of these stories say about us, as creatures, and as a culture? It should be clear why these resonate every decade or so, in different ways, and why we have gotten to a place where instead of having a system that functions for its people, these movies have become a reality. Where we have public spectacles, where poor people jump through humiliating hoops while being displayed to millions, just so they can have necessary surgeries or financial assistance that they need because there's no other way for them to receive it. And I know I don't actually have to say this because it should be clear, but it does help to repeat that these things are not being done for the charity or altruistic goodwill of doing so. They wouldn't be filmed and broadcast online if that was the case, and are instead being performed publicly to raise the presence, finances, and general societal attitudes of the billionaires funding them. There's no substantial difference between Rocky, the MC leading the marathon of They Shoot Horses, Don't They?, and Mr. Beast. Both men fill the same function. They are leeches that spin desperation and misery into gold. Gold for some, yes, but primarily gold and fame for themselves. This correlation of revisiting these kinds of dystopian game shows strongly ties to instances of economic disparity. They can be seen in every instance of these stories, real and fictional, going all the way back to Vespasian, and even before that. They are a warning sign that something has gone wrong, and when people are going through it, unfortunately, it is human nature to channel that into wanting to watch others suffer worse than they are. Why sit at home stewing, when you can just go to the Colosseum for the day.